for a smooth night live. Master Sensei. Ooh, hoo, hoo. It's Cinco de Mayo. And let me tell you, uh, we've, at the dojo headquarters, we've got Cinco de Mayo in full force, right, boys? We've got, uh, we've got a lot going on already. Big show tonight. Super excited about this show. But first of all, look at look what I'm smoking. Fired myself up a dogma because, by golly, that's, that's some serious Mexican San Andreas wrapper on this bad boy right here. These things age... These things age amazingly. I mean, when we were down in Nicaragua uh, a couple months ago, uh, we busted out a, a pack of these. They had a bundle for us down there. And, man, they were just perfect. I, I don't know how many years it's been. It's been like, what, three years? Since we did the dogma? Three? This four? year will be three. three? Year will be yeah, three. But, woo, I'll tell you what. Right now, this is, this is the stuff. So, hey, guys, this is uh, – what is it? May 5th, 2017. Just in case you're watching sometime in the future and you want to know what the date was when we filmed the show, that's the date. It's Cinco de Mayo on the dojo. So everybody's smoking Mexican. So, hey, by the way, I got I had some Mexican beer. I got some Mexican beer. This is, uh, this is uh, who makes this, Dominic? Mexican lager. It's like Ska. Ska brewing, Mexican lager. And... This, this, I'm having this just, just for um, Fernando from Espinosa Cigars. Fernando, if you're watching, I'm drinking a margarita. I know that you think that's weird, but it's good. So uh, cheers to everybody who's celebrating Cinco de Mayo with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes, margaritas, beers, Mexican cigars. That's the theme tonight. I've seen a lot of good stuff on the dojo. Guys getting into the uh, spirit of things. But, hey, we're going to bring on our guest right now. You guys all know uh, our guest probably from, uh, from Smoke In. But this guy's everywhere. He does a little bit of everything. And he's been a good friend to the dojo for years and years and years. So uh, let's go ahead and bring him on the show right now. Abe DeBabna from Smoke In. How are you doing, my friend? What's up, Master Sensei? Hey, man, I'm doing good. What about yourself? I'm hanging here in South Florida, living in paradise, taking it one day at a time. Yeah, you're out on the you're out on the back porch just yep. chilling, having a cigar. Chilling on the lanai, having a cigar. I was gonna work late and stay in the office, but we had a late night last night. One of my employees uh going away party after about ten years and we hooped and hollered and unfortunately I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> yeah, do you wanna say the employee or anything or keep well, that Lady M is still gonna be doing our radio show, but obviously she's worked with me. She's Worked with me for ten years now, and yeah, she, you know, she got married to Duncan, and they're moving, and you know, life moves on. But yeah, you know, she's sad. We're sad, and we're gonna miss her. But luckily, we'll still get to abuse her once a week on the show. So she'll still be doing the show, just not yeah. the all the other yeah. stuff. Yeah. All right. Yeah, because she's. I mean, she's an integral part of all the stuff that you do. I mean, that must have been, you know, uh, touches probably every project that I'm involved in, one way or another. Right. Uh, well, so last night was rough then, huh? You guys, uh, you guys uh, went pretty hard, huh? We went. We we started second. She punched out at six o'clock. That's one of the nice things about having a bar right, right outside your office door. Yeah. So <laughs> we walked about you know thirty feet and started drinking. Went out. We took about sixteen of us to a nice dinner. Then we all came back to the shop and kind of probably hung out there about two thirty in the morning. Wow. Yeah. I've been there before and probably be there tonight myself. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so what are you smoking? Eh? What do you got? I, you yeah. know, I, I, I left, you know, normally I got the big cabinet in my office with a lot of really cool, rare stuff I collect over the years. I left home, so I, I went in my humidor and I, and I, this is one of the ones I've really been enjoying lately the, uh, Casada 70th. Yeah. Yep. Lit her up and, uh, actually she's tasting great. Yeah, that's a really – we just reviewed that cigar. Jordan, what do we give that cigar? Case out of 70. 92. We give that one a 92. Yeah. Uh, super tasty cigar. Lot, real, lot, lots of different interesting flavors in that cigar. I think the ones I got, I got when I was down there with you in Florida, and I just brought them back with me. Terrence and Manuel Casada have really 
diversified their palette profile for that company over the last decade. It's really, really yeah. something else. Done a great job. So, uh, so what's uh, Cinco de Mayo like in uh, South Florida? I don't know. I mean, everybody, you know, everybody's Mexican for a day. Right? It's crazy. <laughs> We had, was, when I left the shop, there was a pinata hanging uh, from one of the rafters. So, uh, <laughs> but it's like St. Patrick's Day. Everybody wants to be Irish for a day, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, hey, it's a good excuse to drink margaritas and tequila and and Mexican beer. So I'm I'm all for it. It's all you got to give them any kind of reason, right? Just give just give me a reason. Yeah, give them a reason. Yeah. So, hey, Abe, so let's talk a little bit about all the things you do. If, if people aren't aware that might be watching that, that aren't familiar with you, you uh, are the face, you're the big delicious, the face behind the smoking smoke shops in South Florida, obviously smoking.com uh, online, and you do KMA Talk Radio, uh, you do the Great Smoke, you have the big poker tournament. I mean, your days are filled. You, you do a little bit of everything. You know, last November, we celebrated our 20th anniversary. And it was uh, honestly a fast 20 years. I mean, can't really believe it when we, when we look at it. Uh, I, I got to share a funny story with you about that, too. We just came up last night. We were laughing for about an hour. Um, but over the years, you know, one of the things I, I based my profession is and, and I kind of do it in my interview process when I interview employees, new potential employees. One of the things I kind of ask them is, "What do you What do you believe I sell for a living?" Hmm. And nine out of ten of them, ah, oh, cigars or whatever, you know. And I, I, I then I, I I break into the explanation is, I said, "Look, no one's ever walked out of one of my stores and said that is the best Monte Cristo I've ever smoked." Or that's the best tatuaje I've ever smoked, because the product is pretty much the same everywhere. Sure. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, ninety percent of my humidor is probably the same as every other guy around the block. I mean, yeah, I got limited in some select items and a little bit more of a selection, but it's. I try to teach them it's the experience of what when they from the moment they walk through the door, how you greet them, how you deal with them, to helping them out in the humidor, helping them on what I like to call, and I've kind of coined over the years, their cigar journey. Ooh. And um, that's what we sell. It's a lifestyle. And I, I, over the years, we've done so many things that now have become just a part of our business between the Great Smoke, which, you know, keeps growing every year. We do an annual poker. T the Great Smoke is our 11th one. Uh, in about three weeks, we're doing our 11th annual poker tournament, which where we sent somebody to Vegas to play in the main event. Wow. wow. Yeah. And it's, it's stuff like that. Like, uh, we're actually having uh, a theme. We do like a theme thing once a month. So uh, well, tomorrow at two of our locations, we have a thing called Paella and Pilsner. So we bought a Pilsner beer in. I got chefs coming in with big bowls to do the paellas. Because that's the stuff people talk about. Right. And that's the stuff they go, you know, human beings by nature, we're emotional people. You know, and, and, and when we like to be moved. And when, when you give a guy that experience where he walks out, he goes, wow, man. Those guys treat me great from the moment I walked through the door that I left. You know, that is what I like to believe has been the cornerstone of our success over the last 20 years. Yeah, so the uh, you have the online thing, but you also have the uh, in-store brick and mortars. And so you're one of the rare guys who's been successful at both of those things. You know, it, and it's, that's got to be tough to be successful at the, the in-store experience because sometimes the uh, – the brick and mortar guys, you know, feel threatened by the online stuff, but you've been successful at both, and and so you know that's a tribute to the customer service that you guys offer and the experience. Well, I, I've always said, if you run a good brick and mortar, the online you shouldn't be threatened by anything, not even local competition, because if you treat the people right, they won't leave. You know, if you haven't been treating them right, the second they have an option or a new choice, guess where they're going. So. If you're, doing, if you're doing your job right and not one of these guys is just sitting there every day to ring a register waiting for anybody to walk through the door, then you'd be all right. And I, and I was always kind of against the online business because I really enjoyed the personalness, the personal touch of the brick and mortar store. Yeah. And just the online part of the business never really excited me because I didn't feel like I could develop that. 
And I'll be honest with you, it was Jonathan Drew who literally, I, we were in the back office, you know, probably talking a few hours about it, who really just convinced me to say, look, you could do that. You could take your personality. He used to call it the A blast. You know, <laughs> you could take that blast and you could put it on the website. You'll do things your way. And he was right. And over the years, we've done that. And we, we, we still try to do that. Like one of the cutest things that we came up with, with for Easter was we sent a big promo out there saying, you know, Easter uh, egg hunts aren't for kids anymore. And we literally did like a little online egg hunt that we told everybody like at noon, we had hidden micro bun five packs all over the site. And you, you found one, you got to add one to your cart for a dollar. So it's stuff like that, that we even try to incorporate in our website from our handwritten letters that we send out with every package to, uh, to making sure that anybody who emails us or calls us with an issue gets dealt with right away, you know, and, and, and you know, that, that was our toughest part for me to swallow getting into the online business. But we found a way to make it personal, you know, and I, and I like that. Right. You know, Abe, in Colorado, there's only a few cigar shops. But in Florida, they're like on every corner, they're like Starbucks in Seattle. That, that must be challenging to deal with the amount of, you know, shops everywhere, but yet, uh, you know, how do you differentiate yourself from every other cigar shop that's, you know, uh, down the block? Uh, I'll tell you, because it's funny, because there's, there's a guy who's literally opening up a big place next to one of my places. And the fortunate part of doing this 20 years is you grow wiser and you learn, because I'll, I'll be honest with you, early on, I, when, when I opened up my second location out of the 11, okay, between location one and two, there might have been one or two cigar shops in that radius. If you went from my first location to my second one and maybe wrapped it another four or five miles around it, there was maybe one or two shops. Today, there's probably about 10, right. okay, and they're still opening, okay? But what I started seeing happening early on, and that's why I, now I really don't care who opens, is the more and more cigar shops that open, the better my business got. Hmm, interesting. It, it, it really is. And I, I come to learn what happened was two things. One is these people really weren't passionate about cigars. They just thought, or, or it was just a hobby for them, so they didn't even run it like a business either. And eventually they would alienate some patronage. Or what was getting really popular were the cigar bar shops that were really more bar that sold cigars. And what I come to discover in my kind of my theory on this whole thing was as these shops opened, they created new smokers. Right. And this percentage of new smoker fellowship that they created, one of two things either happened. Either they dropped the ball on service and providing the customers what they wanted, and eventually they would find me. Or the guy who just started out as a casual cigar smoker trying out a cigar while he's going to his bar started getting really into it. And they didn't have either the selection or the knowledgeable staff to educate this guy along his cigar journey, as I call it. And then they would find me anyway. So in the long run, over the last two years, it, the, the, the competition really hasn't phased us. And, and then again, I'm, I'm a Darwinist and I'm a capitalist. So I believe competition is good for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, Abe, you know, speaking of different types of cigar smokers, you, you've got, you know, your, uh, your guys who smoke cigars when they golf and play poker, and then you've got guys that just, they smoke the same brand all the time. They're kind of like cigar regular type guys. And then you've got the kind of geeky guys that like really get into the hobby and the lifestyle. Do you try to identify the type of cigar smoker when he comes in the door, and do you handle him differently? A lot of big places like, say, you know, like Best Buy or Apple, uh, they identify customers as they come in and they try to calculate what type of customer this is and then they they tailor they tailor their user experience based on that person in the cigar world it's really that way too there's really dramatic differences in the way people get into this hobby do you think about that at all do you, do you oh, tailor the experience being being a retailer and being in sales basically you know some form of customer sales since I can remember as a child it, it's a natural thing for me the hardest part is trying to teach people that it's not natural to because it's even more, Eric, it's even more than just 
the depth of their passion or their involvement in the cigars, whether they're just a casual guy who enjoys a cigar, not really caring what he's smoking, or these guys who dissect the leaf right. and the region it grows from and everything. The guys come to the shop with different needs, and you have to recognize that. Some people are coming there for human interaction. They want to socialize. Some people want to sit in a corner and read a book or the Wall Street Journal and not be bothered. So it's not just how they smoke, it's what they're coming to the shop for, what experience they want. And especially now, over the years that we expanded, <laughs> my son's calling me. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm being interviewed. Come here. <laughs> Say hi, to go to bed. There he is. Check him out. Say hi. Hi. How you doing? Hi. All right. Say good night. Good night. Right. Good night, man. Thanks. Who, we have, who was that, Abe? That's Asher Dargo. Okay. That's Asher Dargo. Nice to meet him. Yeah, he's something else, bro. Next level. Next level. After three girls, if we had him first, we might have not had any more kids. <laughs> but he's something else, really. Um, uh, what were we ta were talking about there at the end? I got distracted. Yeah, you were talking about the t different types of smokers and their what they're looking for when they want to. They, so you said some guys might want to just sit and read. Yeah. Other people want to socialize. There's different needs of what they're looking for, and especially over the last few years where I, I never had bars. My first store with liquor was only four years ago or four and a half years ago. And the bars bring a whole different dynamic. So, you know, you've been in our headquarters in Boynton Beach, and you, and you kind of see, oh, yeah. yeah, we have the bar and kind of a lounge bar area, but if you go all the way to the other side of the shop, it's more of your – traditional right. leather chairs. So we're trying to cater to that different need of the guys who are still looking for that traditional bunch of old guys and sitting around in chairs and debating politics or whatever you know they want to argue about that day and the kind of bar and club atmosphere. So th that's the trick. You know, right. it's, to, to be successful in this business, especially if you're doing the brick and mortar, it's not just about selling the cigars. It's understanding the psyche of why someone's walking through your front door. What is it they're looking for? Right. And, and that's part of what I feel we, we have to provide. So, hey, if you guys are watching the show right now, Jordan, uh, Matt, pay attention to uh, – if you have a question for Abe, just post it on the Dojo app. Grab your phone. Post it on the Dojo app. Just uh, include hashtag AskDojo. And uh, a little later in the show, I'll try to get to all the questions. I, I wrote a few of them down earlier, so I'd be ready. But so if you have a question for Abe, and it can be about anything. It could be, it could be, about, it could be about what Abe's interested in, like anything. It doesn't matter. His shop, Kids My Ass Radio, which is now KMA Talk Radio, anything. Anything you want to ask Abe, post it on the dojo, and I will pose it to him. Hey, Abe, here's a question I have for you is, you know, I've been in really great shops, and I've been in not-so-inviting cigar shops. And, uh, you know, sometimes you go into a cigar shop and you have, like, these eight guys that are there every day and they take up all the chairs and you know, they're old dudes are sitting around smoking and you, you don't feel welcome. Do you, how do you avoid that situation and make, you know, new people coming into the shop feel welcome and so that they don't want to just grab their cigars and leave? It, honestly, it, it's somewhat of an art form. It really is. Cause you know, my first shop was only 900 square feet. Okay. So I want you to picture this. It's not a big shop, 900 square feet. There was probably maybe six highbacks in it. That's it. Right. Okay? And every Saturday, 26 guys got together and had lunch. Hmm. 26 guys. This went on for like three years. You, you had to bring in lunch for everybody. And every other Saturday, you ate for free because it was somebody, other guy's turn. So you okay. had to bring lunch twice a year. And I mean, you want to talk about intimidating. You see these people walk in through the shop and like, what's going on here? You know, um, but that's your job as, as, as the proprietor. And I, I try to teach it to my manager. I said, look, this is a ship and your hand is on the wheel of the ship and you have to coast it and control it and, 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 and take it through calm seas and rough seas. And, and part of that is, look, you have to have the in intuition to know the guy who's yearning to get in the group but doesn't know how or afraid, and the people who just don't want to be around people. And and because some of these people, you know, just like you said, they want to sit and read their book. They don't want to really interact, and that's just what their preference is. But when you see that guy having trouble break, 
breaking the ice. It's your job to bring them in. Hey, right. guys, Mike, you know, you talk to him a little bit first, get to know a little bit about him. So when you introduce him, you, you can bring up some topics of a conversation. But it's an art form. It, what, it, it's what makes a good bartender, a good bartender, wow. a good doorman, a good doorman, you know, who knows everybody in the building. It's, it's, it's a skill. So you, you mentioned that you've been in, in the business now 20 years. Uh, your 20th anniversary was just recently. Does the, does the excitement of just actually the actual smoking cigars, like I've, I've, gotten, some I've gotten involved in, in certain things, like certain hobbies, and, and I've got involved in them so deeply that I sort of lost the fun of the hobby that I enjoyed, you know what I mean? What about you? Like you've been doing this for so long. Do you can you still enjoy cigars as a hobby like you used to? Do you still get into it? Do you still like just sitting around smoking, or or now is it just sort of like all business to you? See, here's the thing for me, which makes me different from a lot of people. My passion for the cigar lifestyle is deeper than my passion for cigars. Hmm. If you can kind of understand what I'm saying, I've always enjoyed the lifestyle, the, the moments, the experience I've had that involved cigar smoking. When I go on vacation, you know, and you know, you're having a cigar vacation, you don't know anybody, you see another guy lighting up, and there's an instant bond, yeah. an instant connection. You guys are talking, you know, and if you're staying in the same hotel, hey, you want to have a cigar tomorrow night? There's a guy you just met. I, that's always intrigued me, and right. I like that. And that's what I get excited about doing, you know? Like, for instance, you know, I like to come up with things that people are going to laugh, talk about, whatever. So, like, for this Memorial Day, we have coming up, um, yeah, a couple weeks. Okay, this is the first time I'm doing this. It's either going to be a hit and be hilarious, or it's going to be an epic fail. I have no idea. <laughs> but, you know, it's Memorial Day, right? So what does most people do on Memorial Day? They barbecue, they get together, they cook out, right? What's the number one typical fruit or dessert everybody has? Watermelon. So the Wednesday before Memorial Day, I got a company delivering a pallet of watermelons Ooh. to every one of my locations. And anybody who buys a box of cigars gets to take home a free watermelon. Nice. Yeah. Either, either they're going to laugh and have a crazy or they're going to talk about it. We'll see what happens. Yeah. But you know but you know, yes. they go back keep it and they're fresh. Still, keep it different. What was that? You got to keep it fresh and different and unique. You got to keep it fresh. You got to keep it different. You got to figure things out. You know, one of the coolest things we started doing was um, about a year ago. I, I think you may have been in the first one. We, we started usually the Sunday after the Great Smoke, and we run it through football season. Because after football season, there's kind of nothing for anybody to do on a Sunday, you know, right. uh, at the shop and stuff. So we started doing brunches. I started seeing brunches was this crazy trend now. Nobody, they're not going to brunch. They're going to brunch like they're like at a nightclub at two in the morning. I was watching videos of this place that opened up by us. They're dancing on the bar tops at noon, you know, rocking music like it's a nightclub at two, at two in the afternoon for brunch. <laughs> yeah, it's like a new trend. So I said, you know what? We're going to do this. We're going to do brunch. And the third Sunday of every month, you know, my, my chef and caterer for 20 years brings in four food stations. He's got an omelet station, waffles, fried chicken. You know, he, every he's got uh, a regular food station that it's either like fish, salmon. He's got an omelet station. He's got a carving prime rib station, and for twenty bucks, we do an all-you-can-eat brunch. Wow! And we get 50, 60 people every Sunday. That's, That's great. Awesome. Yeah, I dig that. Hey, you know, uh, a few years ago, we talked about this early in the show, the, the dogma. Yeah. A few years ago, we had an event on, online, and you were, I think it was a, actually, it was a, it might have been a Tatawahe event, I think, Jordan, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a Tatawahe Herf night, where everybody smoked Tatawahe. Pete Johnson was on, and Abe, you were on, on just on the, on the app, not yeah. on a live show. And I, s somewhere in that, sh in that night, I mentioned, it'd be fun to do a dojo cigar. And you texted me right away, and you were like, you know, you, you want to do a cigar? Let's talk about doing a cigar. And the next day, you said, hey, who would you want to do a cigar with? Anybody. You want to do a cigar with this? Eric, you pick. Anybody you want to do a cigar with, let's do it. 
And I was on the phone and I was just thinking, you know, right. I was just trying to think in my mind, who's the first thing to come to my mind. I said, how about, you know, Jonathan, let's do one with Jonathan. You said, all right, let's do it. You called I Jonathan. My, I think my exact words was, what's your second choice? <laughs> not because they don't make great cigars it's just that you know those guys always run in a, you know back then especially they run at 150 miles an hour and try to get them to sit down and you were on a couple of those calls with me yeah with jonathan you know it's like it, it's so hard and even the release of dogma was a mess because it didn't come like three times Right. When he said it was going to come. Then we got partial shipments. Yeah, it, it wasn't the smoothest release we've ever experienced. But at the end of the day, they made a phenomenal stick. And it sold amazingly fast. And that's that was the – by the way, it, from the day that we decided to make a cigar, when me and you talked, it was a year to the day, to the day, that just by chance. We didn't plan it that way. But uh, by chance, it was a year to the day – that we released the cigar, yep. and that thing sold. So that we had like we had a I don't I don't remember like two hundred bundles at first. They sold really fast. Twenty minutes. And then about a, 20 a month minutes. later, we had four hundred and fifty more bundles, and we did a nighttime sale. Yep. And they, I mean that they flew like crazy, and you guys stayed all night long and mailed every single bundle out. It was amazing. That that see, I mean, but that's it, that's the thing that people appreciate. You know, sometimes people don't understand the log logistics of things like. When, when we do any of our micro blend releases, especially really ones that people are really excited about or like the dogma, you know, when you release it on a Friday and you get six, 700 orders in, you know, you can only have so many guys packing and labeling and doing boxes, right. but we will go and work in shifts and around the clock because we want everybody's package to go out by Monday, you know, and they appreciate that. You know, we try, I mean, look, Nobody's perfect. Sometimes the ball gets dropped, and I believe you know a couple orders that got you know out of the seven hundred, maybe one or two, we drop the ball. But we follow up, we call, and we make sure it ends up right at the end of the day. Yeah, that was a ton of fun. And then just recently, just this past February, we did another cigar with you, which was the Dojo Deluxe from Quesada. And me personally, that that cigar is like right in my wheelhouse. I love that cigar. I, ha I, I have like it. I like the size you did too. Yeah, it's a cool, different kind of classic size. And uh, this weekend, Abe, yep. yeah, Abe, it, you have a, a nice offer for everybody. Yeah. It, it, when you asked me to be on the show, I said, well, you know what? In celebration and in honor of being on uh, Dojo Night Live, this morning we put 25% off on the Dojo Deluxe. And it's going to only be good for this weekend. You don't need a code. You don't need. To do anything, just go to smoking.com, look for uh, Dojo Deluxe. I, mean, I, I, I think it's maybe under Quesada Cigars, or it might be just under Dojo Deluxe. But um, it's 25% off. And, you know, we wanted to do a code that I would say here on the show just for you. But those O's end up being nightmares because they don't get the codes right. Then they call, or, or somebody just ordered yesterday and saw the show today. So, look, we just we put up this morning. From now until... Sunday at midnight, twenty five percent off boxes, and we're uh, we're, we're getting I down to the only, end of those. And yeah, I think there's only like down. between me and you. I think there's only like 70, 75 boxes left of them. So, so folks, if you're watching, and that's going to be another one of these cigars that in a few years you're going to be like, wow, I wish I had got an extra box or two, yeah. uh, just like the Dogma. Uh, grab them now while you can, and especially with twenty five percent off. That's pretty stinking awesome. So Jordan, you should remind people on the dojo about that while we're while we're doing this because that's pretty stinking cool. So hey, yeah, we got, we got the the coming up in a couple of months, so we're trying to yeah make room for all the new stuff. It's sure. amazing that new stuff is still coming out. It's mind boggling. And we don't want to give anything away, but we there may be another cool thing in a few months. We'll see if we can work something out. Right. Um, that we've been working on for a long, long time. <laughs> um, speaking of that, uh, the micro blend series, you you pioneered this, Abe. Out of all of the guys that do these things, like there's always been shop exclusives. Like people have done shop exclusives forever. But the difference with the things like that, that we've done, 
came from you from your your idea, which was not just a shop exclusive where we slap a a ban on it, but something totally unique and really really good. And that came from you guys. You guys pioneered this micro blend idea where you get with the manufacturers and you make something truly unique and good, not just slapping a ban on something, but a whole new blend, a whole new side. So everything's new. The label's <coughs> new. The band's new. And you guys have had some success with that. And that's where all this came from is your guys' uh, you know, brainchild. You know, it really was. It, you know, it just started out to celebrate at that time our 10th anniversary. <laughs> and, wow. um, yeah, it was, you know, in year nine. And, you know, I wanted to do something different. And look, at that time, you were right. Most retailers are very short-sighted and didn't have the vision. Their idea of a shop exclusive was, oh, we're going to make a size for the store that you normally don't make, and that's going to be our shop exclusive, or you know, or or rebanding and putting a secondary band on the same cigar. And it's not what I really wanted. So picking the first guy for me to do this was was, was key, and and you know, Pete, of course, as everybody knows, right. Very imaginative, out of the box thinker, and I, and I knew it wouldn't be hard for me to explain to him what I was looking for, and um, and he gave me really carte blanche and how I wanted to market and advertise it, you know, because I believe like nine months prior to the release, an Anarchy website just showed up where the Tatuaje logo emerged into an Anarchy symbol and it said join the Anarchy and nobody knew what it was about. <laughs> I remember. Pete was getting, the, the day we put it up and we had a couple guys sneak some posts on some cigar forms with just the link to the website. Pete calls me 20 minutes later and says, I'm in Nicaragua. My phone is blowing up. <laughs> Everybody wants to know, is this a band? Is this a clothing company? What is it? I said, bro, just don't say anything. <laughs> Let it ride. And, you know, then we started an anarchy website that had riots and stuff all over the country. And I was superimposed in every scene that nobody knew holding an anarchy cigar. It, just, it, it was really marketing 101. It was the perfect storm. And what sealed the deal was they had made a phenomenal cigar. Yeah. I mean, really a phenomenal cigar. In fact, that's the only micro blend that we ever did a repeat of and they did a, a second release of. Right. So, uh, and that had gone over so well. I said, you know what? Let me do one every quarter for my 10th anniversary. So we were very fortunate enough to work with the Padron family. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, everybody gives you different limitations. With the Padron family, I wasn't getting my own blend. It wasn't happening. But I did manage to have them give me a size that they had never made before, which is a 6x60. And, and it's really funny because I remember sitting in, in, in their back area with um, George and his father. And we were talking... What I really wanted them to do was make a barber pole, mm. okay? And as, as corny and as, you know, you know, tacky as that sounds, being in retail, I, this is how I do it, and I saw most of my clients were the same. I'd go in phases. I'd go for months where, man, the Padron Maduros, Anniversarios are just kicking it. I'm loving them. And I'll smoke just Padron Anniversario Maduros for months. Right. And something in my head, well, let me try natural. Oh, oh, this natural. I forgot how good it tastes. And I'm smoking the naturals for months. And a lot of the guys like them both. Mm -hmm. So I just thought if you could take that caliber of a cigar and make one that had both their Banduro and their natural wrapper, it would really be something special. Okay. So I remember talking to George about it. And George says, nah, I don't. I, I, you know, it's really funny. Anytime George Padron and I will, are having a discussion, it'll start, and he'll, he'll always be, like, hesitant about it, like when, when I wanted to do the SI-15. And then his father will finally say, well, what are you guys talking about? And his father loves me. He calls me the Gordo of West Palm Beach. <laughs> and when George tells his dad, he'll say, oh, no, for Abe, let's do it. So he's always great. So... I'm telling George is thinking, you know, his dad sees George saying, no, 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 it's not going to happen, whatever. And then he finally asked George, you know, what is he talking about? And he said, well, uh, da, 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 you know, da. and a barber pole, too. The guy didn't hesitate. No, 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 no. What's never going to happen. 
never going to make it. It wasn't, wasn't going to happen. So we got him to make the 60 by 60 ring gauge. And at the time, they never had it. Right. And I remember George calling me and saying, look, everybody wants a cigar. And they've been called about it. You know, when you run out of your inventory, because all our micro blends have been a one and done. Right. Um, would you mind if we made it a regular production size? I said, absolutely not. I like that size myself sometimes. So, sure. And then they released the Padron number four after that. And then it just kept rolling with all of them until we had all 10. And early on, thank God I was smart enough to say, let me stash a couple of these away. Mm -hmm. that we ended up putting like a thousand cigars away of every run we ever did. Or just having the manufacturer making that. By, by the time we got later on down the road and figured out, just make an extra run and bundle them. We didn't need them in boxes. And then a few years ago, we released our anniversary sampler that had one cigar of every one we ever made. Right, yeah, that and it came. You get challenge coins. Yeah, for uh, some of them, right? Like you didn't know well, what we challenge. Made, coin we made a challenge coin for everyone, and you got to choose with every box you bought. You got to choose a different challenge coin. So guys were collecting them; they were trading them, and you know we did a thousand boxes. I think I still think we got maybe eighty or ninety boxes still left from that thousand run. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool box. You get the whole the, the whole gamut, everything, in a really nice box, and it described on the on the vista on top. You get to see, you know, each one. You guys did a really nice job with that. Yeah, that's a cool. Year, what year it was released, and what was the production run? Yeah, the trick with that would be like, you know, you almost got to buy a couple so you can smoke some and save that because it's just so cool. It's like a collector's piece, you know. A lot of people did. A lot of people did. And a lot of people honestly ordered multiple ones. They wanted to collect more coins. So it was, it was kind of cool. You yeah, know, we did, five, we did 500 of those that came in a natural because the SI-15 kind of was complicated. It was a micro blend, but it came in natural and Maduro. So 500 of those micro blend boxes came with the Padron natural and 500 came with the Padron Maduro. Right. Hey, uh, speaking of that, that leads us into our first audience question because this is on this topic. And this one comes from Brad from Tampa. He wants to know what was your favorite micro blend cigar that you've done. And let's just let's split this into two categories just for my purposes. What was your favorite one to smoke? And what was your favorite one to work on with the, the company? Like, mm, 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 mm. That's going to be tough. Oh, you know, it, it's kind of hard for me not to try to filter through the biases that I have because, <laughs> you know, anarchy is always going to be, it's like your first child. It was the, the kickstart. It was a great cigar. And, and one of the most underrated ones I thought that just really didn't get any big praise or coverage, but I thought it was always amazing was the Pactum that we did with Dion. That was a great yeah. cigar. No one, no one really talked about it, you know. It's like the stepchild of the set, you know. Um, I think size-wise, size-wise, Pope was one of my favorites. Mm. And El Hijo from my father. Because yeah. those smaller sizes have now become what I – well, not now, actually. It's been my trend now for the last seven or eight years. have become more my – my style. I mean, I love the flavors of Anarchy and especially Big Delicious, but I think uh, El Hijo was one of my all-time favorites, mostly because that little size, that little box press, and Pope. I remember when I told Pope I wanted to do that Corona, he thought, I was, like, Jonathan, I wanted to do a Corona size, he thought I was crazy. Yeah, we had actually had uh, Matt Booth on the show last week, and I, I always loved that Big Delicious cigar. It was real meaty. It tastes like it tastes like you were eating a, a big juicy T-bone steak. That was a really good. That was a really good cigar. I mean, look, we were actually in the works to make a little, little big delicious LBD. I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask you about that. Well, you know, obviously, you saw he left the company, and for me to do a big delicious without Matt Booth, this does not. It doesn't yeah. have the it has. You know, as far as projects, that was one of my funnest projects. You know, we got to make a cartoons trip. It was a 16-week fictional story of how the cigar came about. Every week, guys were going to the Room 101 website, seeing the new five frames loaded of the cartoon. That was pretty cool. Drawing yeah. and 
making my own storyline cartoon. I didn't do the drawing. I did the, the sketching of what I wanted and I gave it to an artist, but I wrote the dialogue and the verbiage and the storyline. I did the storyboard. It was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. But altogether as a project, Anarchy was the best. Just the website, you know, Anarchy got written up in Playboy magazine. Wow. You know, it just it just it was it was crazy. And we made a CD. We hired a band to do their, our own version of uh, Sympathy for the Devil. We made CDs that came with the boxes. You know, it, it was just really an all around great, great fun project. Yeah. And speaking of cigars like that, in your Boynton store, you have your uh, sort of your your rare room. Not many. I don't know how many people get to go in there. I've been in there a couple times. That's an amazing room. You've got some pre-embargo Cubans. You've got some of the cigars that people just can't get. Millenniums the the Millenniums were in there last time that we were in there. Yeah, Jordan brought up. Uh, I, got right, I got right now, I got I got a lot of clear Havanas. I got um, some original uh, Pedro Millenniums in the Millennium Humidor that they came in. That was in 2000. I got some original release Partagas 150s. Mm -hmm. Um you know, it's just either stuff I've collected, kept, and obviously through the years I've, I've always envisioned this because I've been boxing stuff for years. I got them stored in boxes by years. So whenever that room gets low, or the section, we just go to a box and we open up and see what's inside. I, I forgot what I've packed half the time. <laughs> you know, and honestly, sometimes we open it up, we look, and, go, and I say, oh, I packed this. I ain't ready for <laughs> go throw this in the dump bin, you know? Yeah. You know? So it's funny. It's like Christmas. Anytime we open one of those boxes, we don't know what we're gonna get. Yeah, that's a cool room to go in. If you're ever, if you're ever in the Anybody area, go in, you just gotta ask because it's coded. Right. Yeah, you gotta ask. And can I go in there? And and uh, dude, how many people buy those 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 old Cubans that you have? Do those sell often, or are they just kind of sit there, or what? You and we, just so your customers know, who don't your listeners, and they don't know what clear Havanas are. Every cigar that was being made at one point was all made with Cuban tobacco. I mean, they were all that's pretty much what they were using. So, clear Havanas were the machine made cigars that were made here in the U.S. prior to the embargo, which used all 100% pure Cuban tobacco. You know, these are old brands like Roy Tan and a bunch of stuff. And the boxes are some of the coolest pieces because the art. Right. It's on these boxes. It's just amazing. But you know, these cigars are priced five cents each. You know, two right. for fifteen cents. You know, so um, I'm getting a message. Well, let's see. All right. So I make sure you still seeing me, right? I'm still seeing you. All right. So um, there's a small group of people who are hardcore clear Havana collectors. I mean, they are into it. They know it. They're looking for certain ones. So it's got its own little groupie, a groupie you know, following of guys who are just into clear Havana cigars. I got customers who will bring me one. I mean, stuff I've never heard of. I mean, just weird looking names and stuff. And, you know, they're, they're happy that they found a place where they can find other cool stuff like that. Does it, does, do, do, do people ever come in and buy one and just smoke it right then? Yeah. Does that happen? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I smoke one. It's, I mean, it's like, you know, 70 year old cigars. You're not getting really <laughs> much out of it. I, you know, but, you know, I smoked like probably two since I've opened the store. You know, the first one, because I wasn't sure if it was just the way it was or that. Right. But, you know, when you think about it, you know, these tobaccos have been sitting together melded in a cigar for decades so there's right. no complexity i mean there's nothing this thing is just smoking <laughs> hey before i get to the rest of these um uh user questions here uh community questions jordan if you have any let me know but um what's hot right now what's flying off the shelf what brands or or cigars you know give me a few or a couple one or two that just seem to be popular right now that people are just buying like crazy uh, off the shelf. You know, I, I don't think there is that right now. Really? No, no the, 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 the consumer market has gotten so diversified with all the, the, the vehicles in which, in which can, you know, cigar lovers can learn and read and find out about new products. And people are coming in every day looking for something different, trying something new. You know, you talked about 
the guy walking through the door and assessing the customers. You know, look, when I first got in this business, you know, when I had my 900 square foot store and I saw Mr. You know, Smith pull up, I'd walk to the back and pull out his box and put it on the counter before he got to the front door. Right. I can't do that today. And there's so many, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. When I got in the business, there was a handful of people making great cigars. And there was a lot of just mediocre stuff up there. Today, it's the other way around. In fact, I feel sorry for some of these guys trying to get in or struggling to stay in. They make great product. Just so much to choose from. And right. It's hard to get, get their voice out. But, you know, you know the, the Angel's Anvil TAA, you know, when you get these limited TAA releases, that's always going to be hot. That's always what's going to fly. You know, uh, Drew Estate just released their, I mean, that's what's, that's what's happening now. The hotness or what's flying off the shelves isn't based on, oh, this is a new, it happens, you know, like, you know, a, a company will release a cigar and it, it, it was at the right price point, the right blend. A lot of people flock to it. But the problem is, and what I've seen is the shelf life for a successful brand nowadays is about 18 months mm. or it either, it's either going to flatline or it just drops to a lower level and plateaus. It's a lot harder, but like Drew Estate just released their swamp thing or whatever they're calling it. And, you know, the Kentucky Fried cured series or, and, um, you know, those flew, whatever we got in was gone. Wow. So the cigar market has become like the sneaker market, you know, <laughs> the new Jordans and, you know, there are people lining up to get it. And, you know, for a retailer, it's okay. For a consumer, it's great. For a manufacturer, it's a nightmare. Right. Because it's very hard to invest and try to develop any kind of long-term brand. It's that much harder. All right. Uh, this question comes from Cigar Kurt. He wants to know, uh, do you offer a Cigar of the Month Club? You know what? It was one of my first projects when we went online. And um, no, we don't. Uh, we just, we just nothing that ever really took off. Um, I believe those were probably would have been way more popular back in the day, before social media and bloggers and guys like yourselves, who have done a phenomenal job in educating the consumer, because it was a great way for people because they didn't know how to learn new brands. If they didn't right. have a good retail shop in their area where they could walk in, because look, there's two types of retailers. There are retailers who are afraid to buy. And there are retailers who realize if you don't, if you're afraid to spend, you shouldn't be in retail, you know, because right. you know you're not going to be a successful retailer, especially now, unless you learn how to move the product. When the stuff slows down, you got to kill it and bring the new stuff in. Because if you don't bring the new stuff in, they'll find the shop that will have that stuff. So right. um, I think those kind of clubs were better in the day where they couldn't learn about what new stuff was, so new stuff would come to them. So. I, I don't think it's as relevant or prevalent or as needed in today's cigar universe as it was maybe a couple a decade or more ago. Right. right. Yeah, it's yeah, tough because, because the samples, the samples usually have to have a few kind of crappy cigars. cigars in them. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I'm I'm always a believer. Like I even tell the guys, anytime you have an internet customer, always be happy if they call because I'd rather you talk to them. I'd rather you become a phone-in customer. Yeah, we're, I'm the other way around. Most people prefer to push their business toward the automation. I hate that. I would rather have 50 more people answering phones and everybody calling their order in. Because you can't replicate that one-on-one -on -one human experience. You know, mm -hmm. one of my most popular guys, and he's probably known across the country, Izzy, mm -hmm. pretty much handles 90% of my out-of-state or shipping customers. I, I call him the cigar concierge. And that's what he is. He's a concierge of these guys. So instead of a cigar of the month club where I'm going to mail somebody six or seven random cigars and you know they don't know what they're getting, these guys call these and he makes them their own cigar of the month club, exactly what they're looking for. And it's just a better way to do business, in my opinion. All right, this one comes from Ozzy. Ozzy wants to know, he's from Canada, have you ever played hockey? No, no. I'm not a good skater. Everybody says I'd make a great goalie because there wouldn't be much of the net left, but no. 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 I would, have, the black I would have liked you. If I could have been a good skater, I, I would have liked because I you know I did play soccer, you know, and I especially played about four years in an indoor soccer league. So 
I would have enjoyed hockey, but I just couldn't skate. Do you follow the Blackhawks? Absolutely. In fact, I was lucky enough uh, a couple years ago, I uh, got to see game five of the Stanley Cup against Tampa Ooh. here in Florida. Mm. The year they won. Well, that's awesome. What did you think of the Bears' first pick? Say again? What did you think of the, the Chicago Bears' first pick in the draft? You know, listen, <laughs> I like to use Sam Bowie as my uh, example. You know, you never know. You know, for those of you youngins who don't know who Sam Bowie is, he was the guy drafted before Michael Jordan in the NBA draft. <laughs> yeah. Okay? So I, I can't remember that year. I think I, Hakeem Olajuwon was number one. Somebody was number two. Then it was Sam Bowie. And then they <laughs> picked Michael Jordan. Sam Bowie, I don't think, played a year or two and was a terrible pick. So you yeah. don't know. I mean, that's not an easy job to predict. And, and especially nowadays, because I'll be honest with you, I don't believe a lot of the ethic and – I believe a lot of the modern day athletes are uh, what's the word I'm trying to say without sounding wrong, but they, 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 they don't have the right attitude, you know? Mm -hmm. So get, prima donnas, you know, you get some of these guys that are prima donnas. So even though he may be a great athlete, the guy might be uncoachable or not a good team player. So, you know, who knows? All right. Here's the last question for you, Abe. This one comes from Bob L. He says, uh, where do you see your business in five years? Oh, I don't see my business in five years. <laughs> I, no, it's, it's scary. Um, there's a big movement in the cigar industry right now. And, um, and it's, that's why it blows my mind away that, that uh, guys are still opening up shops left and right. Um, the, the big guys are opening up stores or buying successful retailers. Uh, the manufacturers, the, the bigs, are making moves very strong to get into retail. Uh, Davidoff's opening up shops all over the place. Um, CI has opened up stores and looking to open up more from general. Uh, Casa de Monte Cristo has already acquired two or three retailers and are opening up Casa de Monte Cristo shops and, and really moving forward with that concept. So um, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think within the next five years, you're going to see a majority of retail shops owned – or run in some level by a major manufacturer and maybe a few very strong independents who will still survive. Yeah, that's a that's scary thing. With the, that's scary and all. You know, I, I, I'm, I've never been the guy to worry or get scared. You know, it's just kind of one of those things. Whatever it is, you figure out a way to deal with it or you move on. Yeah. All right, the last segment, Abe, we like to uh, psychoanalyze our guests. Huh, huh. So we are, we're going to psychoanalyze you, and oh, uh, this is a little I segment. Before I forget, because I, yeah. I know I'm, I know I'm not going to get it in. I, I promised somebody I know that uh, who's a fan of yours that I'd have to say Kabam sucks. So I just had to say that out there for any of you okay. gamers out there. I guess you'll understand, but I have to say Kabam sucks. So there you go. <laughs> you did it. You did it. I did it. I told him I would. I did it. All right, this uh, this this segment we like to call the world according to Abe. All right? <laughs> so I'm gonna show you uh, four or five images, and you just right off the top of your head, you just whatever comes to your mind, what you think about these topics, and this gives us an insight into the mind of Big Delicious. What so, what ra what rated is this segment? This is just whatever comes to your mind. So. All right? There's no rating. It's not PG-13 or anything. Well, let's let's go with uh, PG-13. What the heck? Well, uh, with with Matt Booth, you know, it was uh, who it was it was a little crazy. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's let's get this let's get this going here. Let's see what all you right. think. Um, all right. Four hundred twenty-five dollar jeans that you can get that are that come pre-muddied. I mean, you want the first word or my opinion on this? What do you? What's your opinion of this? Like, so Nordstrom's is selling from America. They come from four. They cost four hundred twenty-five bucks, and they yeah. come pre muddy. What are your thoughts on that? It's the stupidity that this country is becoming. It's mind boggling. <laughs> Morons. <laughs> it's stupid. So you're not going to run out and get uh, muddy pre muddy jeans? I'm, I'm pre ripped jeans or any of that crap. <laughs> you know. People are just looking for a way to say I'm special. And if it takes a pair of muddy jeans 
to say you're special. There's some deep rooted issues. You should get that four hundred dollars and get two sessions with your local psychologist. Oh, uh, okay. I, I I tend to agree with you on that one. All right, let's go with um, let's go with uh, all right. So there was a bunch of uh, millennials that paid about ten thousand dollars to go to the Fry Festival to see some bands in in uh, the Bahamas, but when they got there, there was no bands. There was there was no private v villas they essentially were like trapped on an island with no food uh did you did you hear about this thing and what what are your thoughts on it? is this a true story this is a true story so there's no concert there's no nothing but they left them tents yes and like what? and like uh, bologna, bologna sandwiches and stuff like that it was it was a nightmare they couldn't even get off the island good serves them right <laughs> Okay, uh, that's funny. Um, all right, let's go with uh, Kim Jong. Does this does Kim Jong Un? Uh, does he does that? Does he send fear into you? What do you think of this North Korean leader? I don't know. It's kind of the same feeling I get when I see Trump. <laughs> you know, I mean, look. You know, I don't want to get into politics. You know. These guys, I don't know what's the matter with them. There's obviously something psychic of life. This guy's not a leader. These guys are supposed to be world leaders. This guy's a brat child. You know, I, I, you know, I don't know. You know, I was really hoping that Trump. I, I believe that Trump had the opportunity, honestly, to like have moved this country in a way that hadn't it hadn't been seen since John F. Kennedy, you know? Yeah. And every time the guy opens his mouth, I get an ulcer, you know? <laughs> it's just so brutal. So I, 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 when I see politics now, I just try to turn off the TV. I know, it's rough, right? It really is, it's, it's depressing. These guys are supposed to be the, the leaders of the world. And this so if, you, if you were President Abe, what would how would you handle this guy who's threatening nuclear war on, you know, South Korea and China and? You know, yeah, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback. You know, I look, yeah, look, how I would deal with stuff like that in my life. I'd go in there and just take over the country and annihilate. <laughs> I mean, that's it. That's how you solve it. But in the world, I mean, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, I know, right? This, I, this guy, this guy, yeah, is basically the personification of something like cancer, right? Mm, yeah. You don't sit here and talk to your body and try to negotiate your cancer. Hey, is there any way you'll just go away? <laughs> I really would like to feel better. No, you blast that stuff with radioactivity and wow. chemo. You know, this guy's the personification of human cancer. What, what do you do? I mean. I don't know why the UN just doesn't say this guy is a danger to the human race. And they, it's perfectly within our, somebody's capacity to just go in there and take the country over and throw them out and anybody who agrees with them. But, you know, then you got the human right, oh, you can't do that. He's a human being too. And you know, <laughs> if you ask me how I will handle it, that's how I would handle it. So you just turn the whole place into a, just a, a, a glass factory, you just melt it. Listen. I'm not for getting involved in inner country issues or neighboring country issues, but when you got a guy who threatens the end of the world, yeah, you go in there, you just level it. You level it, you take it over, throw everybody out, throw everybody in jail, put them all on an island somewhere. <laughs> I don't think there's a wrong thing to do when you're talking about th threatening humankind as an existence, you know? I, I, I hear you. All right, how about uh, how about Stephen Hawking? He recently said, he recently said that it, it maybe would be a good idea if millennials started thinking about evacuating Earth and 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 uh, you know going to some other planet because the Earth is doomed. Uh, this is supposedly the smartest guy in the world. What do you make of his his uh, plea that we should start evacuating Earth? I think that we should put most of these millennials on a ship right now and just send them out there. And them. I, don't know, I think it's sound advice. <laughs> that's so funny that you said that because that's the exact same thing I said. I said, hey, a bunch of millennials leaving Earth, vacating Earth sounds like a brilliant idea. We couldn't get them off the planet fast enough. <laughs> 
All right, last one. Abe, what's more likely – what is, in your mind, what's more likely to be real? Bigfoot or aliens from other planets? Well, you know, I, I've always been a believer. You know, if, if anybody who's really can understand the universe and astronomy and the vastness of it, you know, when – when you take a look at something like our galaxy, just, just our Milky Way galaxy, our, our little galaxy, which in the universe is a grain of sand on a beach, you know what I'm saying? Right. And if you could travel at the fastest known speed that we know of, which is the speed of light, okay? The speed of light, just to put this in perspective for some of your listeners, wraps around the Earth seven times in one second. All right. So the time you say one, the speed, it, 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 it wrapped the earth seven times. And traveling at that speed, it takes eight minutes to get to the sun. Okay? So when you're sun tanning on a beach, those rays are hitting your skin, left the sun eight minutes ago. Okay? Traveling at that phenomenal mind-blowing speed, our galaxy it would take 100,000 years to go from one end of it to the other. And when you say that that vastness is a grain of sand, it's very hard to believe that we are really the only form of life in all of that. So I, I, I you know, to find out one day there's life off outside Earth would would be a zero shock to me. So that wouldn't that wouldn't shock you. But what about Bigfoot? Do you ever think uh, maybe there's Bigfoot out there? Let me tell you something. I've met a couple. I've dated a couple of girls that look. <laughs> I don't think that's too uncommon. <laughs> I hate to say it. I hate to admit it, but yeah, a couple of my old girlfriends look just like that. <laughs> oh, man. And that, my friends, is the world according to Abe. And uh, boy, so I think we got some I think we got some good insight uh, into Abe's. All my girls must say goodnight. Do you not see me doing it? Uh, like, yeah, I learned about the universe. I learned uh, some about Big Food. And I also learned some about Abe's prior, prior girlfriends. Yeah. Which... I wasn't expecting. So that segment always gives us something. Exciting. Listen, so. I can only admit that because of what a beautiful wife I ended up having. That's that's the only reason why I can admit how ugly some of them have been. What was she thinking? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? My wife? Yeah. I got her real drunk. <laughs> I would say I shot well above the bar with my wife. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> All right, Abe. So, hey, that's that hour flew by. Um, Always a thank, pleasure, guys. A good time. Yeah, I want to thank you for taking time on a Friday night to uh, hang with the Cigar Dojo crew and and just uh, just rap with us for a while. I always love having you on the show. Anytime, guys, and keep up the great work, man. You guys always you, you guys are one of the top guys in this industry, as far as I'm concerned, in doing what you do. So, you know, anybody who's a smart retailer and anybody who is a is a consumer who really wants to, because what you've done with your app is what I've kind of talked about. And it's perpetuating that cigar lifestyle and that camaraderie. And I think that's one of the reasons why you guys have been so successful. You understood that. You don't want to just make a newspaper that spits out words and people read it at home with no interaction. You guys made a site that gets everybody talking and interacting together. So, you know, kudos to you. Wow, appreciate that. Yeah, hey, so guys, it's uh, Cinco de Mayo on the Dojo. We're just getting started. This is when the party actually starts. <laughs> the Friday lead into our Cinco de Mayo party. I want to see some I want to see some uh, some some good Mexican wrap cigars. I want to see some good Mexican beer. I want to see some tequila on the dojo tonight. And uh, we'll have some fun. Tomorrow, don't forget, Abe, your show tomorrow. Tell everybody how they can listen to your show. Yeah, we even talk about our show. Listen, I, by the way, just so you know, our show, we started a show about five years ago. It was called Kiss My Ash Radio. And um, we we're airing just in Palm Beach today. We air in Palm. We air in Palm Beach. We have a station in Atlanta, one in Gainesville, um, one in Long Island. We start in Tampa uh, in two weeks, I believe. Uh, a week from tomorrow, we start airing in Tampa, and we're talking to two stations right now in Ohio and Colorado. But we've had to rebrand the name because some of the stations had a hard time with the name "Kiss My Ash," so now it's KMA Talk Radio. We okay. air live 10 a.m. on Saturdays. So every Saturday, you can either come to our website at kmatalkradio.com and listen live. If you have iHeartRadio, you just listen to 900 a.m., um, the Talk of the Palm Beaches. 
and uh, we're on iTunes. And like us on Facebook because our Facebook Live uh, showing of our show every week has been taking off. It's done all in high definition, three camera angles. It's a great way not only to enjoy the show audio-wise, but actually get a nice visual and see what's actually going on in the studio. Who's on the uh, show tomorrow? Uh, good question. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't I mean really, to put you on the spot. I, I really don't know because you know we have a producer, and um, I mean they told me at one point, but I forgot. And normally we have a Friday meeting to go over what we're going to do tomorrow. And Emily obviously was is moving and getting ready to move, so she couldn't come today. And Adam got sick from drinking last night. He went home early. So <laughs> we didn't have a Friday meeting. So, but if if you wait one second, I'll tell you exactly who's on the show because. I have uh, the KMA Talk Radio icon on my phone. There we go. It'll there we tell go. who's on the show tomorrow. Oh, oh, that, well, we're doing a live broadcast from the Camacho. Good thing I looked. I would have went to the studio. We're doing a live broadcast from the Camacho Lounge in Port St. Lucie. And Carlos Escalona from Davidoff Cigars, and who originally worked for Camacho Cigars before Davidoff okay. bought him. He'd been with the company for years. Is going to be on our show. And we got a special guest. Colin Ganley, who's from Twin Engine Coffee, is going to be on. Oh. So we got a guy starting a coffee company going to be on. So cool. cool. So everybody, make sure to tune in for that uh, tomorrow morning, and that'll be fun. I always like to get on the chat when you guys are doing the show. And uh, now, it's, nowadays, I just sort of get on Facebook and make comments. That's a good way to do it. It's been working so, uh, out great. Everybody follow, loves uh, it. Follow, follow them on Facebook and do comments there. And next week, everybody, is our 100th episode. Is it really for you? Show. 100. Congratulations, man. That's huge. I know, right? That's pretty cool. So That's we'll have a big show. I think uh, Juan Cancel, Bill Ives, oh. maybe some other guys will be on the show too. We'll see. It should be interesting. We'll have a good time. I'm going to uh, watch that show next week. Yeah, that'll be fun. So, Abe, thank you very much for being on the oh. show, brother. Hey, listen, if I can ask you listeners one more time, if you listen to the show and like it, please rate us on iTunes. Yes. We'll get our ratings up. If you like the show, go on there and give us a rating. We'll do. I'll, I'll go do that as soon as we get off, off line here. So appreciate Thanks, brother. that. All right, everybody. So we'll see you next week. We'll see you on the dojo tonight. And remember, until then, never yeah. smoke oh. alone. We'll see you. Hey, thanks, man. Good night.